You're going live right now. I'm going to hold off for just a second while we wait for all three services to get up and running. Make sure everything's going smooth. I'm going to rub in my my Burt's beeswax. Just keep my lips from getting all chapped up, uh, which is uh, super gross. And uh, we're, we're going to kick this off. Uh, fat produce. Greetings. So that means I, I believe we are close to being live. You know what I should do? I think I should put together a uh, a start screen, you know, sort of a static image. Uh, you know, like, this is some revelation to me. You know, like, it's, it's normal for video production and for video broadcasting. But I should put together, like, a one-minute ticker just so that this can fill up without me having to ramble. Because we are live uh, from Andrew Wallace on Periscope, which chat works best for you. So I'm currently using an aggregator. I should be able to see chat from... Uh, Periscope and YouTube, I don't know if I'm really properly getting chat from uh, from Twitch. But this is the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show, What, where we talk chat, uh, talk tech, <laughs> and chat about stuff from, uh, from the last week in tech news, get ourselves ready for the week in tech that is about to befall us, and have a fun conversation with folks who are like-minded. So uh, always really fun to join you guys on a Monday morning and actually make it to a Monday morning. Um, time from this is from Cheryl. Time for Monday Tech. It just passed Tuesday for me. <laughs> well, you know, I'm actually making it a little closer. As uh, last week, I was I was sick as a dog. Couldn't I? I couldn't even sit upright to do the Monday morning tech chat show. So we did the Monday morning tech chat show on Tuesday. Uh, and I am feeling better. Thanks, Cheryl, for asking. So uh, we've got a bunch of stories coming up. Uh, some really cool stuff that I want to chat about. Uh, some uh, some really cool technology and science stories. And then also some, some things that I think are going to be frustrating for people in the market for uh, PC building. Again, it's more the reporting on the story than anything else. And also some video game news from a major uh, video game publisher in Germany. I want to get some housekeeping out of the way right quick. First of all... If you're watching this live, you have about 13 hours left to jump in on our Honor View 10 giveaway. This is courtesy of Honor UK. I'm partnering up with my buddy TK Bay, uh, who's an amazing voice in uh, in tech and conversation and reviewing, and uh, you should definitely check his YouTube channel out too. Uh, but TK and I, uh, we have a blue, a gorgeous blue Honor View 10 to give away courtesy of Honor UK. They hooked us up, and uh, you've got about 12 hours left. Well, no, about 13 hours left if you're watching this live. If you're listening to this in the pre-recorded podcast, I'm sorry, you've probably already missed it. But I've just uh, been cracking into the View 10. I maybe took it out last night. I got some some dust on it. I uh, maybe took it out last night, shot some night photography with it. I maybe just plugged it into my, uh, my USB audio interface to get my... Uh, uh, to get my audio samples recorded. Andrew Wallace, hashtag audio, <laughs> real audio review for patrons, smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. Um, so that, that I, I wasn't going to make a big deal out of that, Andrew, but I might as well mention, I think from here on out, I will be moving real audio and real camera reviews to Patreon. So the uh, the amount of time and effort and energy it takes to produce one of those uh, just isn't really properly being subsidized by YouTube anymore. And there's a community of people that are supporting uh, the channel and the production, and I feel that would be probably one of the best perks that I could give them is the more in-depth analysis. I'm still looking to do a full phone review. That'll be a public video on my channel, but the more in-depth stuff like the audio review will probably be going to, uh, to a patron-only uh, subscription. So... Um, that's, uh, that's the major thing right there is, uh, you could wait for me to talk about the view 10 or you could go and just win one. Um, the numbers are looking pretty good in terms of your odds of actually winning, uh, this honor view 10 that we're going to be giving away. So I'm pretty stoked about it. This is a pretty killer phone. I definitely have a few criticisms, but, um, in all, in my first couple days of use, really getting into this phone, really digging into it, playing some games on it and, uh, using it as my daily driver, actually having my SIM card inside this phone, I am very much enjoying the experience of this, especially considering the price point where this is being positioned directly against a phone like uh, the OnePlus 5T. So that'll be a really fun uh, showdown. 
and uh, from Ganzi Tech Nerd. Not to forget the demonetization woes of YouTube. Yeah, unfortunately, we're we're still coping with uh, a lot of those problems. I see Chad Christian, Christian Senior, Chad, Coach CWC. I'm seeing Chatty Boy, Chatty Boy, saying you're late, late. You, I just got started. <laughs> you're like perfectly on time. I haven't even started talking about tech and news and stuff. So uh, some really cool stuff. Um, the other little bit of housekeeping, I have finally revived the SGGQA podcast RSS feed. And so the Monday Morning Tech Chat is also going to be uh, saved and rebroadcast as, uh, as an audio-only link. So if you... Um, oh, hey, from Rena Chan on Twitch. What's up? I actually have a Twitch watcher. <laughs> Um, and from Peter Hayton, how do you think the View 10 compares with Huawei proper, especially given P20 light rumors? So, Peter, I will be covering that in my review of the View 10. Uh, I, it, I need to spend a little bit more time with it and kind of play some stuff back and forth. There are certainly some compromises. There is a reason why someone would want to spend more for a Mate 10 Pro over the View 10. But... Again, I, like once I've once I've used the phone a little bit more, I think I'll be able to speak to that a bit more intelligently. I'm still kind of getting my feet wet. Um, yes, so the SGGQA podcast RSS feed, the links for that, I never really went away, even though um, I stopped producing the podcast for a really long time. And uh, I'm currently sorting out. F I know I've been saying this for a little while, but I'm 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 almost ready to to go go. Uh, so I'm sorting out all of the uh, the scheduling for my first series of guests. So what I'm I'm hoping to produce, uh, the Monday morning tech chat will be sort of the main weekly show, and then I want to do an additional like sort of end of week or later in the week, and probably not every week, but as close to it as I can, uh, more of a conversation chat interview style uh, podcast, an additional podcast. So if, if I can work this out, where it's a Monday morning tech chat talking about news and links and all that fun stuff and then like a friday interview uh, i think that would be ideal and so uh I i'm speaking to a couple of my favorite tech bloggers just who we can uh who they can line up who i can line up first i'm really wanting to get a, a pretty diverse group of people to chat with a flow ion or a an Erica Griffin, right alongside a TK Bay, Anna Bong Etta, uh, Michael Fisher, some some really interesting folks out there that I want to have conversations with. But um, I, I am looking at making sure that the conversation, uh, the last bit of housekeeping. So coming up March 26th, a uh, week from today, I'm going down to UCLA. I'm going to speak with uh, Dr. Grimes, one of the top audiologists in the country. And we're going to have a conversation about hearing loss in young people. She has a special, uh, she specializes in pediatrics, which is exactly uh, one of the conversations I want to have, especially, uh, you know, the father of a toddler, where how we're introducing certain bits of lifestyle technology to kids could be having a substantially negative impact on their overall health uh, later in life, especially when we're talking about ear health. From Renata Chan, you can ask Michael about HEVC. <laughs> we got into a fun public debate about HEVC video compression, um, and it got pretty brutal because I was totally right. Um, <laughs> but uh, Dr. Grimes, uh, next week. So um, I'm putting this out there for uh, viewers and for listeners, people subscribe to the podcast and people who are watching this on whatever streaming service I'm producing this on. What are some questions that you might have about ear health? What are some questions that you might be hoping to have answered about headphone design, about uh, best practices? What are some good habits? Those are some of the questions that I'm hoping to, uh, to engage in a conversation with. With. And that's going to be the, the full long form discussion of that is going to be uh, a podcast for the SGG QA show. So uh, you're going to want to make sure you're subscribed on that RSS feed so that you can catch the full conversation because I'm probably only going to do a cut up like highlight, maybe like a three to five minute video for YouTube because YouTube sucks and I hate them. Uh, so um, is that talk with Dr. Grimes going to be for Patreon supporters only? No, 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 no. The, that will be public. That will be live on the podcast. So everyone's going to have a chance to listen to that. Once the podcast, once Patreon starts reaching some podcast goals, uh, yeah, once Patreon starts reading some, reaching some podcast goals, words are hard in the morning, and I'm only about halfway through my first cup of coffee. Once the Patreon goals start getting met, what Patreon is going to be is an ad-free uh, subscription for the podcast. Uh, currently, because we haven't met those goals, I'm just putting together one version of the audio feed, which is going to have a bunch of ads baked into 
that discussion. But um, public on YouTube will be a master cut, sort of like a, three, like I said, a three to five minute uh, shortened version of the uh, of the conversation. And then the full long form with ads is going to be on the public RSS feed. And then Patreon has its own specific rss feed which i'm going to start populating once that goal's been met so you know if we can uh, help spread the word on uh that kind of uh i do need an extra shot of caffeine thanks cheryl um once we can start spreading the word on that kind of conversation and the patreon can start pulling a little bit more of its weight one of the things that i'm also really hoping the patreon can be is a way to subsidize uh phone review costs so you don't i don't have to keep begging and borrowing and stealing hardware from manufacturers because i feel that kind of colors the type of criticisms you can deliver when uh you know you're getting all your review hardware from companies that can be sort of punitive or at least reactionary towards the types of criticisms you might have um, from Cheryl, also, where do we send in the extra questions? Maybe an email. Maybe you can open a Patreon post for those who are on board. That is a great idea, Cheryl, because uh, right now I've just sort of been relying on Twitter. You are absolutely correct. I should probably do a public post on the Patreon. And so be on the lookout for that. It'll probably show up uh, Tuesday, uh, March 20th. I will put up a public post on Patreon that everybody can reply to. And uh, I'll make that part of one of my production diaries for Patreon, but it'll be public so that people can ask questions there. I, I really do. I really do want sort of a simplified one point of entry so that people. Uh, so one, I don't have to go looking for stuff all over the place. But uh, we should probably get on with some actual stories of the week. Uh, I've got some cool new stuff up here, and I'm going to click right there. And the first one that I wanted to talk about. Uh, let me get this queued up. So, Stephen Hawking's breathtaking final multiverse theory completed two weeks before he died. Uh, I, definitely uh, one of the most important news stories of the year uh, was the passing of Dr. Stephen Hawking. And uh, he, he, there were so many people trying to sum up, you know, how they felt or put into words and... Obviously, there, there, there's there's a profound sense of loss that this voice is no longer contributing to scientific study, research, and in the endeavor of the human spirit. Um, but I, but I also think that there's an amazing story in what he was able to contribute to humanity, what he was able to contribute to scientific endeavor and research, uh, given given his limitations. And I think th that above all is just an extremely inspirational uh, story to share with everyone who comes after us. You know, the, there was this man who was given sort of a death sentence uh, because of, his, uh, of a disease, and he not only managed to beat it, but beat it pretty significantly. And so, uh, you know, definitely a, a rest in peace kind of situation, even, even for my more atheistic uh, tendencies. You know, that's, I, I kind of feel like, a rest in peace is maybe appropriate. I don't know. See, that's one of the other things, too, about being fairly non-religious is, like, we don't have very good language on how to express loss and concern and, you know, to, to, to deliver feelings of goodwill other than to say, I deliver my feelings of goodwill. But um, from uh, Gab... I've already mispronounced your name. Gabaletta on YouTube. That man is a living proof that if you really fight for what you want, you can make it happen regardless of the odds absolutely true i just <laughs> and from fat produce he's on the ship to stubble core i don't know i don't know i kind of feel like he, we, we'd be talking about some sort of vulcan ritual maybe not a klingon ritual <laughs> for dr hawking <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry um that one that one got me andrew very well done but uh I think one of the things that's just so impressive about this story is even right up to the to the days before he he finally shuffled off this mortal coil mortal coil before he finally left this plane of existence um he was still putting together working theories of how the universe might work and completed one and this this is this is an impressive piece of of uh, mental exercise that he's put together. 
we've always had these sort of feelings. We've always had these sort of hypotheses uh, regarding the nature of the universe and how the universe was obviously how the universe was created, how the universe exploded into existence. But then because of that explosion, was there the potential for, uh, you know, a multiverse, you know, alternate dimensions or an alternate universe kind of uh, explanation of, of the current place that we live in. And uh, I've, I've read some really interesting papers, like the idea of the universe as trying to trying to encapsulate infinite space within the notion of sort of a finite amount of material that maybe a universe could have a border in a sense where other universes literally if you just flew far enough you would escape our universe and arrive at another universe of course completely hypothetical that's a hypothesis what Stephen Hawking was working on and this is one of the things that that I, I think some of the news coverage has gotten incorrect in the way that they're trying to describe what he's put together here is he deals in theories where theories should be a working model to explain the function of something or and and especially in the ability to predict the outcome of certain stimulus within that within that system so when we say dr hawking came up with a theory we're talking like theory of gravity not I have a guess that maybe there could be another universe out there. Wah, wah. You know, like that's that that I feel like immediately that just deserves its own sort of classification. But what what his theory is, what this working model uh, intends to predict would be evidence that a multiverse system was created uh within the rapid expansion of the of our universe post Big Bang. Um that there should be some evidence in certain uh, certain areas of background radiation in our universe. And if we could put together a spaceship to go out and collect information on the sort of background radiation of the universe, we could potentially discover evidence of a multiverse. And this is this is also one of, I think, the great tragedies of Stephen Hawking in terms of, you know, how... He's obviously well recognized. He's obviously been well celebrated, but he never did land that Nobel Prize. You know, again, m few individuals I think more deserving. But then dealing with such theoretical, so so far beyond the pale, theoretical research and theoretical ideas, that he never managed to land the criteria to really be in the running. I mean, he was always in the running, but to to really land that Nobel Prize, and this was a potential for him where. Had we collected information on the current state of our universe, he might have he might have found the information, the uh, the actual evidence to support this working model that he's theorized, and that would have put him in line for uh, a Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize. Um, so it's just uh, it, you know it's one of those sort of bittersweet stories. You know, here we've got this last piece of of uh, of information, this last piece of research from from Dr. Hawking. And uh, it, it, we're, we're still, I think, a ways from being able to verify and to study and to test this, uh, this idea within, uh, within the realms of our current set of tools. And hopefully at some point we can look back on this and say, like, you know, he delivered us this, the, 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 the protocols, the testing, the idea behind how we might be able to verify a multiverse idea from Andrew Wallace uh, on Twitch, and hopefully he will be awarded posthumously. That, um, that, that would be, I think, the, the, the only fitting <laughs> tribute if, this, if, we're, if we're able to actually collect, uh, collect information on it, collect evidence of it. Um, from Ganesh, the multiverse may actually be true, and someone from some other Earth may have been so impressed with Hawking that his soul and memories may have been snatched by them. He may actually be alive <laughs> elsewhere. Well, and it's the same thing, you know, like it's there are so many lovely ideas and, and I mean, like I feel like he would have enjoyed some of the jokes in his honor, you know, regarding, you know, his travels or, you know, he was snatched up by beings from another multiverse. The He was the man who it's my favorite joke. He he made, you know, he he held a party for time travelers and didn't tell anyone about the party until after the party because it was a party for time travelers. I think he had a wicked sense of humor and he really would have appreciated 
uh, just this outpouring of discussion and this outpouring of, I mean, not even grief, but of celebration of his memory, of his heritage, of his legacy. And then also just the hilarious jokes, you know, kind of coming forth from the, the dirtier pockets of the Internet. You know, like, did you try, you know, replacing his batteries? Did you try turning them off and on again? I mean, I think he would have I, I think he would have gotten a kick out of all of the people, all of the people you know, coming together to celebrate and to have fun uh, with with who he was and what he represented. From Fat Produce, the first person to travel to another universe needs to be careful. Agony booths or event horizon hell. Okay, so uh, Andrew and I had this conversation a while back, just like movies that kind of wig this out. And uh, I got to say, um, from Cheryl, you're talking to the guy who won against Data in a poker game and that grin in that episode. <laughs> That's right. I mean, like immediately when I heard that he'd passed, the first thing I thought of was like, well, he's up in heaven playing poker against Data um, again in a heaven that he nor I actually probably believed in. So, um, you know, Andrew and I were talking about other movies and like uh, some of some of these things that were very impressionable on us. And, and Event Horizon keeps coming back up as this uh, this film, uh, this this movie that had like this huge impact on people. And we all remember it as being like this terrifying film, so much scarier in our brains and in our memories. And if you go back and you rewatch it again, I mean, it's still effective. I think it still works at what it tries to do, but it's kind of silly. You know, you, you get on this spaceship and it's all full of like high vault, vaulted, vaunted or vaulted. I think it's vaunted ceilings, you know, gothic architecture doors with like human impaling spikes on them. No one would ever build a spaceship like that. That's that's not a thing. And then the depictions of, like, the hell dimension are also just sort of... They were way scarier in the flashes of my memory. Like, my brain made them into things that were scarier than than what they actually look like. Um, so, yeah. I... I I, I wholly, I wholeheartedly recommend rewatching Event Horizon. But if you actually watch it, you don't hide your eyes and you don't let your brain take over and imagine things that are way worse. The movie doesn't hold up as well as you think it might. So I want to switch over to things that. Uh, speaking of holding up not as well as you think they might. From Peter Hayton, I'd rather travel on the heart of gold. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know that I'd rather travel on the Heart of Go Gold. What was uh, Slardy Bartfast's ship? The Bistromatic? Was that what it was? The one where it's a flying uh, it's a flying Italian bistro restaurant thing? I'd much rather travel on that. I feel that would be a much safer journey than the Heart of Gold. See, see, like, Event Horizon is all about, like, scary hell dimension travel. Heart of Gold is just the wacky improbability and unpredictability of space travel. I think I want something a lot more reliable than that, and I'd much rather fly through space in, like, a, a two-bit diner uh, deli bistro where I could probably get a mediocre bowl of spaghetti and meatballs and then make it to my destination safely. So, so that's just me. Um, speaking of things that don't work... Uh, power outage at Samsung's fab destroys 3.5% of global NAND flash output for March. So, um, I've already gotten a, a number of people sort of tweeting at me that this is not as bad as it sounds what it might be. Uh, 3.5% of go global NAND. So essentially Samsung lost about a day, a day's worth of NAND output. And uh, I actually got a bunch of tweets uh, from Ian Cutris, and Ian is the senior editor over at Anantech. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and also, I mean, just like one of the smartest guys I know about tech stuff, especially overclocking and uh, PC building. I mean, especially I really enjoy uh, the, the testing protocol over at Anantech for how they put together uh, systems and they build uh, computers and they test components. Uh, still been one of my top resources for how I read up on tech stuff. But uh, you know, so so I, I I just posted even just the teaser for this this uh, Monday morning tech chat, and he was Im almost immediately on top of <laughs> you know like it's not as bad as what some of the stories are making it out to be. It's not the doom and gloom. This is uh, this is bad, but it's not like terrible. So essentially, we lost one day of NAND fabrication. From Samsung, losing one day of 
NAND is essentially 3.5% of the global output for flash memory for the month of March. Um, and, and, and some Sheryl, a day of output lost is still a big deal, especially with DRAM prices these days. So NAND flash is, um, is the, uh, the technology that goes into solid state drives. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of all in a crunch for hardware right now where every single system component, uh, from the actual Ram that goes into your PC chipsets, GPUs, especially, uh, the entire world market is getting hammered. And so news of this, this is what I think is kind of frustrating. News of this is probably likely to influence hardware prices. Just as we've got speculators in like the oil market, you know, like, oh no, uh, production at one refinery was interrupted for a day and we would instantly see gasoline prices at the pump skyrocket, jump significantly. Even though that petrol that gasoline had already been paid for and the interruption in crude supply would take days or weeks to fully uh affect the market there were people trading on gasoline and trading on crude that could instantly manipulate prices because of the way that crypto has been influencing the hardware market crypto uh cryptocurrencies blockchain tech uh data mining using gpus because of the way that that's already inflated prices, a story like this, I really do feel, will likely have some kind of impact on consumer prices on these products, even though the actual interruption to supply and the actual interruption to manufacturing was relatively small, considering you know the impact that it had. That these numbers are, are, are big, these numbers are scary, but losing one day's worth of output shouldn't have a substantial impact on the overall market. It's this losing this one day of manufacturing is just something that we need to discuss, especially for, you know, I think it's a it's a val valuable story in that so, so much energy goes into the production of these components, and these components are now responsible for so, so much power draw. You know, uh, some of the estimates on Bitcoin, how much energy bitcoin utilizes is not insignificant and it's something that we should look at and it's something that should hopefully spur on uh you know uh, further developments in energy efficiency at the same time renewable uh power sources this is from uh from rena chan on twitch this can be used as an excuse for prices to go even higher just what we needed aside of the lack of real competition and the mining mania uh, this is from Ronald Collins. NAND goes in SS in SD cards and SSDs. DRAM is a different type. No, no, Ronald Collins, I think his point, uh, we were talking uh, before, it's that the entire industry is finding price raises and price uh, inflation points. And now this could be used as yet another way to inflate prices on one specific component. Not that we're conflating NAND with DRAM. It's just that manufacturing is, is going to face some kind of impact. If this story, I mean, like I'm talking about it because I think it's worth talking about, like I said, um, because part of the reason why this, this happened was because of a power outage. So a power outage in a Samsung uh, fabrication plant disrupted 3.5% of the global output for the month of March, you know? So, you know, I don't know that you can make a, a an uninterruptible power supply big enough for a manufacturer of, uh, of memory chips. That's, uh, that's probably not a thing. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's a, a funny state of affairs. So, yeah, I'm I'm still in the process of of rebuilding the Franken PC. Uh, Hera is the name of my uh, of my current workstation. She's an old Intel 5820K with with 64 gigabytes of RAM and and a ton of storage space, and unfortunately a GTX 970, which was part of that uh, class action lawsuit. And I kind of got burned by that card. Got a whole whopping I think twenty five dollars back from that class action. But, you know, as we've been going through, I'm kind of holding off until maybe Computex before I really push the button on rebuilding. I've waited so long. I'm going to have to replace so many individual components, motherboard uh, for a different chipset. Probably going to go with a uh, Threadripper. And by the time I'm ready to push the, push the button on a Threadripper, we're probably going to be close to a yearly TikTok refresh on Threadripper. And I'm, I'm really considering 
Um, keep that RAM. It's worth, it's worth its weight in gold. It's gut rot RAM, but again, I mean, it's not like overclocking really awesome stuff like that. Um, have you thought about upgrading to a GTX 1060 from Fat Produce? I have not. I really don't like piecemealing different upgrades. I think the only reason I would consider a GTX 1060 would be if, uh, because that's that's a little bit better than a lateral move from my 970. The GTX 1060 should be able to mostly outperform my 970 and shouldn't have any of the memory configuration shenanigans. The reason there was a 970 uh, class action lawsuit is because it was advertised as a four gigabyte card. NVIDIA purposely built a, a, a RAM buffer. So it's really 3.5 gigabytes of fast RAM and this overflow buffer, which radically tanked the performance of the card if you ever touched that part of the buffer. And it really was that they were trying to further delineate the performance between the 970 and the 980, and it was a really scummy way to do it. So, so getting back to uh, the 1060... Um, the 1060 should be an improvement over my 970, even though it's technically a tier lower, um, if only because they're not playing that game with RAM anymore. But the only reason I think I would get one is if I run some kind of upgrade or step-up program, like EVGA. So I go out and I buy a 1060 uh, EVGA graphics card, and I subscribe into this upgrade system that they've got. I can then put the cost of that 1060 towards a 1080 or a 1080 Ti. But I think, I'm thinking, sorry, to get back to my original point, I'm thinking of waiting until Computex, uh, because then when all the new stuff comes out, I'm kind of expecting that there's going to be a minor bubble pop for the current gear that's out there right now. And I think prices on 1080 Ti's will likely plunge, especially if I can source them used from places that I think are reputable. So, uh, or refurbs, you know. I think that might be the way that I tackle my upgrade. And so I'm, I won't be bleeding edge. I won't be going to whatever new generation, like if it's an 1160 from NVIDIA, or I mean an, an 1180, or if it's a 1090 or whatever they decide to call it. Um, I, I think I'll probably, I'll probably look at making that jump uh, for last gen tech with hopefully... Uh, speculative prices having crippled the resale market for that gear. That's another thing that's really scary about the way that these stories unfold and the way that we kind of catch a mania over a new technology. Um, Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrencies in general are inflating prices on this gear. You know, so much of this is now being sold over MSRP. And it's always been in our market that MSRP was this sort of threshold that you shouldn't ever have to pay, that there should always be a margin that companies can sell under MSRP. Now being so far ahead of MSRP means that when it's time to resell, that you're not going to you're not going to be able to recapture the value, the actual currency value that you put into that product. And uh, that's going to be a pretty rough state of affairs. Um, from Fat Produce. Keep me posted on that then, Juan, because I'm looking for a new GPU. No, no, no. This is my totally secret plan. This is only me. I'm the only one who thought of this. <laughs> uh, from Cheryl, I'm still rocking an R7 370. I do need to plug in more cores in my CPU, though, to help in video rendering. Yeah, that's why I'm wanting to go Threadripper. Uh, uh, AMD's 16-core beast of a chipset, basically two CPUs stapled together in one housing, and it's it's just glorious, and and I want it so bad. In fact, uh, because of... I almost made this one of the stories of the week, and we can probably talk about this a little bit too, is uh, NVIDIA's graphics partner program. Um, I'm also hoping that we can see some competition from AMD, in the uh, in the GPU space, uh, I, I'll be really curious to see, especially with AMD and Intel partnering for GPU tech on Intel chipsets. Uh, the, the, there's this NVIDIA program that manufacturers can subscribe to, and no one's really talking about what the particulars of the program are. Uh, well, actually, a lot of people are trying to talk about what the particulars of the program are, but people who are actually a part of the program have been pretty tight-lipped as to what the uh, the ramifications of the partnership program are and what the um, um, 
from Ibrahim Mosin. What does MSRP stand for? Manufacturer suggested retail price. So manufacturer says, we think this card's worth $1,000. And then retailers buy cards below that so they can make a profit. So there's a natural buffer in that price. And a retailer can say, well, we spent $800 per unit and the MSRP is 1000 so we can make it look like you're saving money. If we sell the card for 900 we make $100 profit. The consumer isn't having to buy the card at MSRP, and everybody's happy. Right now, uh, I you know the MSRP on a 1080 graphics card is somewhere around $1,000, and they're selling for well over that MSRP because of the demand on cryptocurrencies. And from Sherrill, the oh man, the NVIDIA GPP, been following the news and it sounds sketchy. So I, I really hope someone will break part of whatever NDA or embargo is on this plan. Because if it's as restrictive as people are hypothesizing it is, I think that will have a negative impact on the future of gaming hardware. Supposedly, allegedly, I have no confirmation on this. The, the GPP um, requires manufacturers to conform to NVIDIA spec on, on certain pieces of manufacturing, and it also prevents a manufacturer from calling an AMD graphics card a gaming card. So again, this isn't the case as far as I know, but if you're a company like ASUS, and you have your ROG brand, that's Republic of Gamers. It's kind of their high, one of their high-end labels for gaming hardware. If you were a part of this NVIDIA uh, graphics partner program, and the graphics partner program was as restrictive as people are hypothesizing it is, then if you make an NVIDIA graphics card under the GPP, under the ROG label, then technically you would not be allowed to make an AMD card under that same ROG label. Like you wouldn't be able to make an, an AMD card called a gaming card. You'd still be able to make an AMD graphics card, but the branding on that could, couldn't say gamer anywhere on it. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, we don't have, as far as I know, and someone link me if I'm wrong, we don't have proper confirmation that that is what's in the GPP, but that has been the hypothesis as to why we haven't seen quite the same proliferation and the same diversity of AMD graphics cards as we have their NVIDIA counterparts. So that's a developing story, one that's kind of breaking right now in gaming circles and one that I think we still need a little bit more time on. I don't think it will take long before someone leaks or breaks uh, an NDA on what the GPP completely includes. And then we, I feel we should save our outrage to see what's actually in there and see how restrictive NVIDIA might be on there if it's as if it's as brutal as what people are claiming it to be then i think there's the potential for antitrust or uh, some sort of lawsuit regarding monopolistic business practices again we have to wait and see what the uh, what the the issue is from ronald collins there are only two graphics card makers correct uh nvidia versus amd uh the old <coughs> excuse me that one caught me by surprise <clears throat> and that one caught me by surprise again, too. My voice is still not 100%. Um, correct. Uh, NVIDIA and AMD, two major suppliers. Although I would be very surprised if we didn't see Intel in this space from a more consumer perspective. Probably not anytime soon for high-end, discrete gaming parts. But I think um, dedicated, hardcore, number-crunching hardware this this is what a graphics card does really well is is a very brutal number crunching which works great for analyzing gaming and working out the uh the math the algorithms and the uh the uh, physics of video games so that that's why these graphics cards have have been so well utilized in things like video rendering um, my, my current video editing software of choice is Magix Vegas Pro, formerly Sony Vegas. And this most recent update tremendously improved GPU support. So when I was rendering a 4K video, I'm trying to remember what the timing was. A really high quality 4K video from high quality 4K video files 
I think like the last time I did a real camera review, those are typically between 10 and 15 minute videos. And the last one I did, I think took almost two and a half hours to render. My rendering times have been cut to a quarter of what they once were because of better GPU support. That's how effective a graphics, uh, graphics card, a graphics processing unit can be um, for reducing the, the processing time of a very specific task. They are terrible for general computing. So that's why you, you, you want this good combination, a good CPU, which is a great all-rounder. It's able to take information from a bunch of different sources. It's able to multitask really well. Graphics card, focus in on crunching numbers for one specific task and just break it as hard as you can. From Demir Frank on YouTube, nice to see you doing this regularly. Hey, Demir, welcome to the live stream. Everyone go check out Demir's channel. <clears throat> he just joined us on the uh, the old phone, the old smartphone challenge uh, with the one plus one. Uh, great video, really in-depth review on what it was like to use uh, an older Android device in 2018. And from Rena Chan, do we have any hope in Intel graphics? I mean, they are partnering up with AMD graphics for their own APUs. Well, so one of the things that I think is going to be critical moving forward for GPUs. And one of the reasons why I think Intel is looking to get in the into the space even with their partnership with AMD isn't necessarily graphics, not in the traditional way that we understand GPUs for gaming. But I would totally expect to see Intel starting to look at what ARM has been doing for the mobile market, what AMD has been doing with their APUs uh for uh just general computing. <clears throat> and what NVIDIA has done with their graphics processing and the most recent, uh, the most recent fab for uh, their graphics cards. Because I think there's going to be increasingly demand for specialized hardware that can carry out individual tasks more efficiently. Look at, um, look at Huawei. Huawei and Honor using uh, high silicon chipsets. I don't, where's my Mate 10? I can't find my Mate 10. That's not good. Uh they have a, a, a tremendously great processor. The, the Kirin 970 is a great chipset. It's super powerful. But one of the things that actually pushes it into futuristic territory <clears throat> is something they call the NPU, which is a neural processing unit. And basically, it's an on-device machine learning chip just to help crunch information that comes from the camera sensor and to help with things like on-device language translation. So if you fire up the Microsoft Translator app, it hits the NPU, not the CPU. And when you point your camera, a Huawei camera at something, it is very quick to identify what the subject of your photo is. So you hold up the camera and a little icon in the bottom of the screen tells you, oh, that's a, that's a pet, that's a cat, that's a dog, or that's food. <clears throat> Or it can recognize lighting conditions. Like last night I was out shooting with the View 10 and I pointed the camera up at the creepy tunnel and I got a little icon saying, we, we instantly recognize that you're trying to shoot a landscape photo of really dark conditions. You see a little moon icon. If a CPU, a general all-purpose computing unit, has to do that kind of processing, it is substantially slower than what... Uh, Huawei has done with the NPU because the NPU has one job analyze this information look for patterns display what the pattern might be to the user done that's it the pattern could be language so it can look at text and say that language is Spanish you speak English here's a translation done or the other visual information like photos you know I, I'm looking at this this is a cat you know you were trying to take a picture of a cat <clears throat> So um, I think Intel is probably looking at some of those developments and looking at how they can augment their current CPU tech. And I think that's going to be sort of the next escalating arms race is let's say blockchain takes over in a way where it's we start to feel the effects of it in our daily lives. So it's not just cryptocurrency, but maybe content distribution has some sort of blockchain thumbprint or blockchain component to it. Um, maybe the next major chunks of the internet are built in a very sort of uh, bit torrenty kind of way. You wouldn't want a CPU handling that information sort of at the, the front of your computer's queue. That would tremendously slow down your overall computing experience. But if your 
next generation CPU had some kind of neural processing, machine learning, or graphics style, GPU style component tacked onto it, then all of that stuff could be run separate from the multitasking computing that you've got set up. <clears throat> so I think we kind of need to stop thinking of graphics cards as being the gamer way what we make the prettier images from our video games and looking at that as this was the first step that we took towards dedicated hardcore number crunching, predictive analysis and uh, video rendering and mainline work. From here on out, I think we're going to start seeing more individual little units that can be added to the chain to help take off the load from our CPU. And I think that's probably one of the things that, um, that Intel is going to be looking at to, uh, to improve processor design. From Shirill, we may go the SOC route with Intel CPUs, at least for the mobile space. The Atom was their first step, so we will see less single-purpose silicon like the NPU on a laptop. That's, that's a potential, too. I'll be curious to see, though, because Intel keeps walking into that space and then walking out of that space. Uh, you know, ARM and X-Scale design uh, way back in the day, and then uh, the Atom, and they kind of gave up on the Atom. And now Windows, Microsoft looking at better support for Windows 10 on phone-style chipsets. So, of course, the first, the first chipset that they show off is Windows 10 running on a Qualcomm 835. If I was Intel, I would be very nervous about low-cost PCs, ultra-low-cost PCs. Uh, that can run Windows 10 reasonably well on ARM chipsets. So I, I, I would imagine we would probably see some kind of uh, some kind of move from Intel to make up those differences and make up that space. <coughs> from Chatty Boy, Intel is annoying with that. You know, again, it's consistency. If if Intel had stuck around on ARM during the days of Windows Mobile, if they hadn't sold off their X-Scale division, just think about the position they would be in today opposite Qualcomm for chipsets and phones. It would be it would be insane. And from Rena Chan, hopefully we'll see more apps taking advantage of the NPU when EMUI gets updated with their neural networks API support. So yeah, that's also the other the other problem is a GPU right now is very well understood. If a company makes a proprietary other processing unit, an NPU, they are the ones responsible for making sure that it can somehow be integrated into the computing that we already do. So Huawei's NPU right now is fairly limited in what it can use. It, you have to have APIs that go out there and, and properly reference that hardware. But they are also working to translate Google's neural networking kit and AR uh, resources and camera resources and all of that so that it can more seamlessly participate with the rest of the Android ecosystem. Um, from Shereel, oh man, the X scales. I remember that chip. It was mainly used by Dell. Uh, well, Dell Dell had the Axion, but X scale was used in a ton of products. I mean, uh, the the iPacks were using X scales, and that's how I got into mobile mobile tech PDAs and stuff. Was on an old. Uh, so the first one I actually owned was the H3950. So that was uh, HP had already bought out Compaq. From Nicholas Blackmore, this is a this is a a sponsored comment. Talk about screen protectors, please. Um, not a whole lot I can talk about right now. Um, I think the the current uh, screen protector experiment that I'm rocking is on my LG V30, where the corners are curved just enough to make fitting a screen protector super difficult. And uh, this is the one that came with uh, with my Zizo case so this is the rugged bumper case that I use on my v30 and it's doing a pretty good job um, I did crack my Verizon screen protector for the v30 I did a video on that because at the time I think that was probably the best option that v30 owners had for uh, for their phone was the one that came from from Verizon and it was really crazy expensive so um, from Pedro Andrade tea and water man protect that voice um, I'm working it so hard. I'm not doing a good job right now because I'm drinking coffee. But yeah, I, I've been eliminating numerous bags of chamomile uh, just to try and help soothe what's going on here and a little bit of extra honey uh, to coat what's happening in the back of my throat. But um, get, getting back to uh, Nicholas Blackmore, the company that I'm most interested in trying some of their newer products would be, uh, what is that, Whitestone? The... Uh, 
the screen protector <laughs> from Marina Chan. Nah, tequila. That's the best for the throat. I don't know. I'm, I'm a big fan of a good bourbon. Uh, you know, just numb everything in the back of your esophagus. Um, but no, what is that? Was it White Stone Dome, something like that? Yeah, White Stone Dome official website. So uh, this is the uh, this is the company I'm going to try and, and use one of their uh, screen protectors next. And it's this dome glass with some kind of liquid coat that goes into it and it's supposed to eliminate gaps and bubbles and uh so that's uh that's the uh the thing that i'm gonna try next i don't know it, it, it's one of those things i really wish more manufacturers would just make their own first party um screen protector solution because i think that would be uh ideal Onion syrup, natural medicine from Pedro Andrade. I've not tried onion syrup. And then from Fat Produce, random question, is the S3 Frontier a good replacement for the LG Watch Urbane first gen? I'm standing in Best Buy at the moment. <coughs> um, from Demir Frank, liquid glass protectors are bad. So I, I just haven't tried one. So I just need to try one and see how are they bad. Because I've heard from people, like people who actually buy them and use them, like, oh, this is amazing. So I'm just kind of curious what the experience is like. Right now, I'm kind of just happy with regular glass that tends to break on me, and then I replace it, and then I go on with my life. Um, from LGH, uh, from from LGH replying to Shereal, iPacs were made by HTC, ergo terrible quality. Same as QTech E10 and HTC's own phones today. I don't think the no, I mean like the HTC iPacks were really well built. I think the, I think they were better built than the compact iPacks were. I, my 3950 was a lot nicer than the 3630. Um, I don't know. I think that would be a matter of opinion and a personal preference. But um, one of the things that I did, speaking of components and costs and manufacturing, one of the things that I did want to take a quick look at was a story that came out today from Tech Insights, and they have a cost comparison. A breakdown between the Galaxy S9 Plus, Galaxy Note 8, Galaxy S, uh, Galaxy S8 Plus, iPhone 8 Plus, and iPhone 10. It's the worst title ever, um, but I, I want to see, can I make this bigger? Yes, yes, I can. So they're breaking down the component costs for the top phones from Apple and from Samsung. And so they actually have all of these little pieces, you know, assembly, supporting materials, substrate sensor, RF components, power management. Um, and, and so this is this is just the components list and the cost to actually cram all of those components into uh, into an individual product. Um, so we're looking at the iPhone 10, the iPhone 8 Plus, Galaxy S8 Plus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that I think is really interesting, first of all, the component costs between the Galaxy S9 Plus and the Note 8 the S9 Plus, according to Tech Insights, is a more expensive phone to produce than the Note 8, which is really interesting considering the Note 8 has a Wacom digitizer with the S Pen. But that Note 8 is, is according to them, is technically $10 cheaper to produce. Oh, and I guess I should probably tell what some of these costs are. So according to Tech Insights, manufacturing an iPhone 10 costs Apple around $389.50 as compared to the iPhone 8 Plus, which is $324.50. So you can see that significant cost difference is around $64 per unit um, between an, eight, an iPhone 8 Plus and an iPhone 10. Uh, the, the, the differences are a little closer. A Galaxy S9 Plus, they... <clears throat> They estimate is around three hundred and seventy nine dollars, so about ten dollars cheaper than an iPhone ten. And the Note eight is three hundred and sixty nine dollars, or about twenty dollars cheaper to manufacture than an iPhone ten. So, uh, <clears throat> so one just kind of interesting to see that the Galaxy S nine Plus is ten dollars per unit to manufacture than the iPhone ten. But the iPhone 10 is selling for a slightly wider profit margin. There's more padding built into that than what we see on the S9 Plus. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm still trying to clear my throat here. I can't get that last little bit of, of gunk. It's super gross. Biology, humans, we're super gross. <clears throat> 
So, uh, yeah, we've, we've always sort of made these cost estimates. And, uh, well, one of the things that's a little disingenuous here is much, much more goes into the price of a phone than just the actual components that go into the phone. So that profit margin that people seem to get really upset about, like, oh, Apple's gouging their consumers. Well, no, Apple makes most of their money on iOS. So that, that phone has to support an infrastructure of stores. It has to support... Um, you know, the development of new products, and it has to support a billion-dollar advertising campaign. <clears throat> so it kind of would make a lot of sense that their $1,000 phone is more than 50% profit for them to engage in that kind of, uh, in that kind of manufacturing. But I did think it was kind of interesting to see just how expensive the estimates were for the Galaxy S9 Plus. Let me look up Galaxy S9 Plus price... I actually don't <clears throat> don't remember if it if it's eight forty eight fifty something like that that uh no I, these stupid search results let me just go to Samsung because I want to see what the unlocked price is for the Galaxy S nine come on buy now and so here's the Samsung website. So yeah, the S9 Plus is an $840 phone, which is only $10 cheaper to manufacture according to Tech Insights. So there's a lot less buffer pricing margin, you know, profit built into the uh, Galaxy ecosystem than the uh, Apple ecosystem. So, you know, for those things that we talk about, those things that we say we care about, um, there is sort of more stuff in a Galaxy than there is in an iPhone. Uh, to take advantage of. Um, definitely, uh, probably better battery tech, what with Samsung's recent woes, and uh, Apple always looking at throttling their processors. So uh, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Galaxy S9, Galaxy S9 Plus, only a little bit cheaper to manufacture than uh, than an iPhone 10. So uh, I want to move on to this. So this was a sort of a frustrating story to, uh, to catch up on. Oh, so I want to see this. I, I just got a whole slew of messages in here from, uh, oh, someone just messaged me, and I don't know what phone just sent me the, uh, the notification. So this is from Andrew Wallace. Self-driving Uber car kills Arizona woman in first fatal autonomous car crash. All right, let's see. Uber... Hills, Arizona. Let's see. So this is uh, let me uh. Here we'll pull up the New York Times. Uh, I'm gonna screen share this again too. So this sounds like it's a pretty terrible story. Self-driving Uber car kills Arizona pedestrian. A woman, a woman in Tempe, Arizona, died after being hit by a self-driving car operated by Uber in what appears to be the first known death of a pedestrian stuck, struck by an autonomous vehicle on the road. The Uber vehicle was in autonomous mode with a human safety driver at the wheel when it struck the woman who was crossing the street outside of a crosswalk. The Tempe police said in a statement, the episode occurred overnight, although the authorities did not specify whether it was late Sunday or early Monday. The woman was not publicly identified. An Uber spokeswoman said the company was fully cooperating with the local authorities. Uh, the company said it had suspended testing of its self-driving cars in Tempe, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, and Toronto. Well, I'll be curious to see uh, what the fallout is on this. There... Um, there was a there were a number of hypotheses of people guessing why are you on the volume on my phone is on when it shouldn't be. There were a lot of people su suggesting that the first time a self driving car was engaged in some kind of fatality that would that would be a huge knock to the overall industry surrounding self driving cars. And we didn't really see it um, when uh, when that one driver was using autopilot on a Tesla and collided with a semi, uh, there was still a human error uh, element to that, that, it, you know, it looked like he was watching a video instead of paying attention to the road where autopilot is really sort of a way to augment driving. It's not a full, what do they call that? Like a class three system? Is that is that what the designation is for a car that is completely autonomous? Uh, Tesla's autopilot is not completely auto autonomous. 
um, from Rena Chan. The gold thing about those cars is that they have a black box that records everything. And yeah, you were going to need sort of that flight recorder status, which is funny because it's things we've been adding to regular cars. Like I have a, a, a car computer plug-in chip that Bluetooths over to my phone to track all of my vehicle information uh, while I'm operating the car. So I would imagine that Uber has something similar too. But I'll be curious to see <clears throat> what their findings are a woman crossing the street outside of a crosswalk at night versus an autonomous car, even with a human safety operator, that's that's got to be a tricky setup for any piece of software to figure out how to react in, in a moment like that. So I, I'll be curious to see what the findings are, and I hope that we get actual information from Uber and from the, the Arizona police as, as opposed to just sensationalized headlines. We're going to be running into these philosophical dilemmas. Uh, how should a piece of software react to a sudden uh, stimulus in its environment? We don't want cars that overcorrect, and we don't want cars that are going to put the inhabitants of that vehicle at risk. And I kind of feel that there's, there's a... <laughs> This sounds so weird to say that there's a digital morality which should match the human conditions if a human driver were facing the same situation. That if there were an obstacle, a human driver will react to try and protect the occupants of the vehicle. And I think a self-driving car should try to do likewise uh, in the immediacy of scanning its environment and understanding what it needs to understand in that moment. That's terrible that someone will have to code a piece of software to protect the occupants over an outside, uh, an outside obstacle or an outside barrier. But we're, it's really, I think the only thing that kind of makes sense to me within reason, you try and protect everybody, but given the final last ditch choice between people inside the car and people outside the car, I, I think that's the clearest case that we can make. A human driver, you know, while it's dark outside late at night or early in the morning and someone steps out in front of that car, there's a very high likelihood that a human driver probably also would have collided with a pedestrian and unfortunately killed that pedestrian. There are going to be those situations where, you know, a car is not magic. I mean, a self-driving car is not magic. So there's little way to train a car or have a car adapt in a, to a situation like that where a human totally wouldn't have been able to adapt to a situation like that um so i don't know well, well we'll have to see this is a really sad story and i hope that we'll get good information out of what happened here um but then also it's it's going to continue playing into what kind of tech is uber utilizing and will we be able to come up with some kind of of universal communication standard uh, from Cheryl. We're, we're in the early days of figuring out what the heck we need to do with driverless cars. Um, and from LGH, oh no, LGH is still talking about HTC phones and ODMs and O2 and a HTC. And I, I'm way not into that right now. Sorry, LGH. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, Uber is also under scrutiny right now because of the self-driving tech that they're using having been potentially lifted from Google and not properly licensed. So they're going to be in a fairly actionable position if it's somehow shown that maybe there's some sort of inferiority for their setup that could have been leveraged against a, a more appropriate system. And, and I think we're kind of coming in on the point where as self-driving cars start start making it out onto public roadways as self-driving cars become a larger and larger force in consumer transportation that I think human operated vehicles will probably have to have some kind of beacon on them. Uh, so, so like, for example, I've got my car computer, that little plug is Bluetooth, it goes to my phone and it tells my phone basically everything that's going on with my car, you know, engine health, maintenance, operating temperatures, speed, RPM, what gear I'm in, also kind of funky for my continuously variable transmission, fuel efficiency, whether or not I've, I've just recently gotten into an accident, um, and all of the inputs that I'm delivering, you know, the throttle, the brake, and uh, steering wheel are all being communicated to that car in real time too. 
if a car has a beacon that a self-driving car can communicate with within a certain given range, <clears throat> we would be able to much better predict behavior on the roadways. We would be able to much better operate with sort of a digital buffer to prevent some of the uh, some of the accidents which human drivers are very likely to cause in a in an environment where self-driving cars operate within very sort of strict and alien like rules you know like a car that drives perfect doesn't feel right <laughs> in, in traffic against a bunch of other vehicles and i think that's some of the research that google was finding with their self-driving car pro uh, project that google self-driving cars had been involved in numerous minor traffic collisions but they were all caused by human drivers and the unpredictability of human drivers and <clears throat> It would be kind of nice if there was a way that we could also deliver demerits, you know, like self-driving cars is against is following behind a human car and the human car makes like an emergency lane change. Well, you know, where was the turn signal? Oh, you get one social media point demerit, you know, <laughs> like what they're doing in China, which is actually really scary, is that notion of having like a social media currency. So, you know, if, if you're a good citizen, you get, you know, these great social media points. And if you're a bad citizen, then you don't. I, I There's a part of me that does kind of want that for drivers in Los Angeles. You're like, oh, that car cut me off and didn't need to. Because L.A. is, 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 is home, is the king of the emergency lane change when the car that cuts you off is going 20 miles an hour slower than you and there's no one behind you in traffic but it's just i need to be in this lane and i need to be in there right now and i can't be bothered to look around i'm just gonna go and people will break for me is is absolutely uh this the condition of driving that you'll face in los angeles it's the most lackadaisically aggressive form of driving i think found anywhere in the world because other places in the world are scary places to drive but they're aggressive aggressive you know like you drive in in boston massachusetts that is a a, a hell on wheels roller derby style of driving but people are very clear about their objective and they're very aggressive about their ob objective you come to la and in this bumper to bumper traffic where everybody's zoning out it's just this sort of casual i'm just gonna foggily sort of drift over into the lane that i want but i'm not going to use my turn signal because then people will try to block me but they're trying to block me because i'm merging and changing lanes like an asshole and that's just never any fun um i do want to get to some of these other stories here real quick um we were talking about samsung components and apple components and this story just in the way that it's being reported is another story that's kind of obnoxious. So this was the the price uh, the price sheet here. So I, I picked one of the more obnoxious uh, <laughs> reportings on the story. Apple secretly developing its own screens for the first time. And I would highly recommend. I'm going to put all the links. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to put all the links below this uh, for the stories that we're covering this week uh, below this video. But the the little three minute news clip that they have here is one of the funniest like business tech news stories that I think I've seen in a while. Or you know, Apple is designing and producing its own de device displays for the first time using a secret manufacturing facility near its California headquarters to make small number of screens for testing purposes, according to people familiar with the situation. This is so top secret and so salacious. And Bloomberg has the scoop because it's a secret and not something that they, they want anyone to know about. But the news clip is hilarious because they have on this business expert. Hold on, let me just kill the audio here, and I'll, I'll stream some of it. Uh, this this business ex expert, tech expert out of Singapore, and they keep trying to pin them on like, so what are the ramifications for this? You know, Apple's going to disrupt the market. And the guy uh, Brian Ma, um, uh, IDC VP of Devices Research, um, Brian Ma is totally reasonable. He's like, no, Apple has been working towards you know, uh, individual components and, and using different suppliers for components for a while now. Yeah, but Apple's going to do this thing and, and it's going to change a whole bunch of stuff. And like, well, yeah, I mean, Samsung could be affected because Samsung has like 97% of the display market. So that, that, that could definitely be felt in the market. Oh, but Apple's always failed at these types of, of things that they're trying to do. And, and isn't this going to be bad for Apple? Cause we can't see Apple doing this well. Well, no, Apple makes a lot of stuff. They could probably do it really well. And micro LED could be kind of a, kind of a big deal. It's hilarious. 
So yeah, I I I I totally recommend checking out this this Bloomberg news bit um, when I get the link up uh, when I get the link in the show notes because it's it's just so funny the way that we're trying to latch on to any kind of gotcha tidbit of sensational news and that's even impacting like a news story on Apple displays micro LED could be really cool tech. Apple could do something really interesting in the industry, and we're seeing Apple try to be disruptive with their manufacturing, you know, going to Intel for for uh, smartphone radios. So that could be some really cool stuff. I mean, especially if you're an iOS fan, ha- Apple having more control over manufacturing, supply, and distribution could be a really good thing for people in, uh, in the iOS ecosystem. But business news people are almost always wrong and almost always way behind the curve. And their analysis is almost always based on if the market doesn't change in any way, these are the forecasts that we can come up with for 10 years from now, which is ridiculous. Again, just sort of furthering this really short-sighted uh, next fiscal quarter kind of thinking, you know, how people are investing money and moving stocks around and, and it's this, and from from Marina Chan on Twitch, it's this urge to turn everything Apple into a major into a major headline, when not everything really deserves to be a major business news headline. <clears throat> Let's say Apple is working on micro LED display tech for a new generation of iPhones. Do we think that that's going to show up next year, where Apple will be able to manufacture at scale? No. LG has been working on OLEDs for as long as Samsung has. And they had issues manufacturing PO LEDs at scale for all of the phones that ended up utilizing LG displays. Specifically, too, the LG V30 and the Pixel 2 XL. There were issues there. So what? Well, I mean, let me let me put it out to you guys. What what do we think the timeline for an Apple designed, built, manufactured display would be? My guess would be five years. My guess would be for the number of displays that Apple would need to fulfill, even for a single generation of iPhone, that we are probably about five years away from Apple being able to execute that at scale if they are skunks working the technology today. And then um, from LGH, uh, why would it be good for iOS users? Um, Well, having Apple design the hardware specifically for the implementation that they would be looking at for for an iPhone, I think would be good. Let's say Apple's initiatives are, you know, uh, for augmented reality. Well, OLEDs are really good displays for things like contrast and color saturation. And that looks really impressive when you show someone who's using an LCD, a Samsung phone because it's juicy and it's vibrant and the blacks are super inky black. But OLEDs still face, you know, inconsistencies in manufacturing. They still they still face problems with color shift and they still face problems with overheating uh, and they definitely face problems with burn-in. So we could utilize something like micro LED and, and I could get really excited about micro LED with say a quad pixel arrangement. So right now, OLED screens typically use some kind of pen tile. So each pixel on a display is made up of sub pixels for individual colors. Pen tile doesn't deliver all of the sub pixel colors for every dot on your screen. It kind of shifts them up. And even on a super pixel dense display, you can kind of see some screen dooring, you know, that, that gating effect. Like when you're looking through a window and it's got like a mesh on it, there are instances where you can encounter that. And especially if you shoot video of these products, like I was shooting video of the Lumia 1020, which has a pentile grid OLED display, and it's not very pixel dense. So you can see very clearly uh, that screen door effect. So um, if we took an LCD and we did quad pixel, every pixel would have a red, a green, and a blue. So the actual sub pixel density would be better for fine detail. And then we can include uh, like a special white sub pixel. So that white sub pixel, what the human eye responds to the most is the difference between light and dark. Color helps inform that 
that situation, but that's one of the reasons why video often has highly compressed color information and much fuller light information. So if we had a white subpixel, we had four subpixels, then our displays would be white, uh, would be brighter and crisper. And then micro LED should help uh, reduce some of the issues with backlighting. So with smarter backlighting, then we can get an improved contrast ratio with an overall brighter display. So right now, Enabong, I, I, I was on his podcast. Right now, I think currently the brightest OLED is somewhere around 1,000 nits, and it can't sustain 1,000 nits for very long. Uh, these are typically burst view brightness modes for when your phone is in direct sunlight. And the manufacturers are assuming that's a momentary look. You're going to look at your phone and you're going to put it back down. You're not going to sustain that brightness. And it's also bad for the display if you're trying to maximize that brightness the entire time. Um, if we can find a way, if Apple can find a way to more cost effectively manufacture micro LED and incorporate better subpixel technology, that would be a huge get for a world where Apple is trying to interact with more augmented reality services. Uh, you'd probably also with LCD, you'd probably be able to crank up refresh rate and make some sort of G-Sync like solution. Uh, G-Sync is where the frame rate of a game matches the display rate of your monitor. So let's say your game, your monitor is is cycling at 144 hertz, cycling 144 times per second, but your game is only really hitting around 100 FPS, then the game G-Sync can tell, or FreeSync, AMD's version is called FreeSync, can tell the monitor, scale back and absolutely match the frames per second from the game, and then you have less inst instances of tearing or funky frames that are only partially rendered. Um, it, it, it provides a, a cleaner and clearer uh, experience for for the the person looking at that at that display, and that's something that um, Razer is doing in their phone. The Razer phone utilizes something where the screen refresh rate will match certain games that actually take advantage of that technology in their phone. And if any company wanted to do something interesting like that, I think Apple could do really well with that. This is from Ganzi Tech Nerd on YouTube. The micro LED displays need to be assembled one subpixel at a time, and this manufacturing caveat is yet to be worked out. So Apple will take time to solve this. That's one of the biggies is Apple, I don't think they're putting as much money into R&D as they probably should for the next phase of mobile computing. But this would be something where Apple's enormous stockpile of liquid assets of cash could go really well towards helping to solve that problem. Micro LED is extremely cost intense to manufacture right now. And Apple is a company that's all about reducing manufacturing costs and finding preferred manufacturing deals for their uh, component suppliers. So if they were to put their money and their talent and their resources towards solving the micro LED problem, they're absolutely the company that I think could crack that nut the fastest. So from LGH, ah, okay, so it's a good thing for iOS users because they can profit from that technology. Let's hope others will dive into it as well. Only read about Samsung micro LED related to TVs. Yeah, and so there, I mean, because again, there are those different manufacturing outputs towards what we assume is gonna go into a mobile device versus something that's gonna be bolted to your wall and is gonna be a pretty static experience. And then also, who can operate this at scale in a way that will that makes the most sense for consumers? And Samsung has made the decision that OLED is the way to go for phones and that QLED and micro LED will be the way to go for their TVs, which I think is really interesting because in my brain, it would kind of be the opposite. You'd want the brighter technology, which is less prone to burn in, to be on the device, which is going to be used in direct sunlight and has static UI elements that exacerbate the problems with burn-in. So that to me would be kind of where you'd want to balance that equation. But Samsung has made the opposite decision versus, you know, like LG, where I think they're still, they're still pushing OLED for TVs and they're looking at walking back to LCD for the follow-up to the LG G6. So whatever G7 or whatever they decide to call their next phone will likely have an LCD display. Um, that, that means they probably won't be a uh, daydream compliant, which I don't think anyone's really going to be that upset about. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Oh, Ganzi Tech Nerd. Yeah, not to forget that in-screen fingerprint sensors that may need to be incorporated underneath the micro LED screens. Yeah, that's actually a good point, too, is whatever technology that we start making translucent is we'll have to find a solution to have light information and sensors pass through the visual aspects of that display. That's that's a true point, too. But I think we're all sort of racing towards that in the, in, in the industry right now with differing solutions. I, I mean, it was probably six years ago now, maybe seven, where I did an LG display tour where they were showing off translucent displays on vending machines. So there are companies that are working really hard on figuring out how to uh, to make that shift from tech leather craft, but then the phones will cost more than $1,300. <laughs> Regardless of what tech we eventually arrive on for phones, I think we all just need to assume that... Um, Phones are going to continue to lobster pot and get more expensive. I, I don't know that we've found the upper end cap on what a premium phone uh, will will be. Uh, from Sheryl, man, I wonder if the micro LED will benefit gamers though. Uh, it, you know, micro LED on its own probably won't have a direct benefit over OLED in that. If and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, in that the micro LED tech itself is really more about the consistency of backlighting and how to improve contrast ratio on something like an LCD display. So it will benefit gamers similarly in that your blacks will be blacker, your dark your dark colors will be darker. But um, I don't think that micro LED on its own is necessarily going to improve gaming. What we would also be looking at is micro LED in combination with a triple or quad subpixel arrangement and then a panel that can that can much faster with a much faster refresh rate. So all of those techs together could be really interesting for the market. It's not just micro LED, uh, from what I understand. Micro LED is just different parts of your backlight able to change brightness depending on what's on your display. So still a benefit, but not one that I think is is necessarily super important on its own. It's when all of these technologies combine together. Um, I want to wrap this up because I've been talking for a while. I just realized we're we're getting on to uh, <laughs> we're getting on to about ninety minutes here. There was one last story I wanted to cover, and this one I'm gonna have to bounce back and forth between the Reddit and the actual story. This one's a really big deal to me. I have been very upset about the current state of gaming, uh, especially as it pertains to microtransactions and some of the uglier aspects of major licensee holders like Disney. Supporting games that involve family franchises and gambling mechanics. So Star Wars Battlefront 2 is a perfect example of a game that completely got out of hand with not only pay to win, but pay to gamble to potentially get stuff in the game that you could then win. So uh, this is coming from, from, this is the actual Reddit post. The biggest German video game magazine reduces scores for games with microtransactions. So I, uh, this is the actual story that GameStar, GameStar.de, uh, they're a game review publication. And, uh, you know, I, I can't read German very well um, or very much at all. So I also pulled up the Google Translate uh, just to kind of read through. But essentially what they're going to be doing from now on is looking at the the various aspects of the microtransactions in a game. So immediately when you go to GameStar's post, the top four or five comments on this story are all about, well, developers need to make money somehow. I want you to calm your jets. I want you to chill out. Just take a nice deep breath. They're not going to be criticizing all microtransactions. If you read the story, and you might have to Google Translate it unless you're better at speaking German than I am. If you read the story, they are very clear and they are very direct about how their rankings will be affected depending on the type of microtransaction and how badly, I should say how poorly that microtransaction is incorporated into the game. So, if you have a game and there are microtransactions, but those microtransactions have no effect on gameplay, then they will not count against the score for that game. 
if you have a game where you can immediately use real world money to buy the bestest gun in the game and beat the end boss without any kind of leveling up, any kind of experience, any kind of self-improvement, any kind of player mechanic, then that will count significantly against the overall score for the game. So what they are what they are trying to combat in their game scores are mechanics which become pay to win. Not pay to play, not pay to accessorize, not buy to play. It's just solely can you buy your way out of playing the game? Well, that's bad game design. I mean, really think about it. If if a developer is improving game mechanics and is coming up with an with an interesting story and is is highlighting improvements in in video gaming, you should want to play that game more. If they are padding the length of their game with dumb grinding elements that make you accrue resources so that you can eventually level up, then that's bad design. That's Star Wars Battlefront. They don't really have thousands of hours of gameplay in Star Wars Battlefront. That, that's not really a thing. So they are making you grind longer and longer and longer. So they're incorporating pain points into the design of the game to encourage you to spend real-world money on unlocking characters that are substantially more powerful. And the reason why I'm still fighting uh, Disney on this is that they are completely complicit in delivering these franchises to developers to incorporate these game mechanics. Uh, currently went through the same thing with Marvel Future Fight. It's a mobile game. So we expect, uh, you know, a lot of gotcha mechanics in a smartphone game, you know, cooldown clocks and random number generating events. But Marvel is a family franchise and they incorporated their own loot box style gambling mechanic with real world money and that got hammered. So what did they do? The replacement for the loot box was to introduce characters that take months of grinding to unlock and further months of grinding to level up so that they're actually player competitive. Or you can buy a special box for $45 per character that will give you some materials towards improving the character. It won't fully rank up the character, won't fully uh, unlock and improve the character, but it just helps you abbreviate some of the grind for trying to capture one of these characters. The, the roster for Marvel Future, Future Fight is over 150 individual different characters from the world of Marvel, and each one of these new characters that they killed the loot box for, that material costs you $45 of real-world uh, real currency to abbreviate some of the crazy and ridiculous grind. If I'm doing the math on fully... Like, if you wanted to go from zero, not having the character at all, to having a fully leveled up, uh, tier two, super-powered character, you would need to purchase this package three times per character. So you'd be spending, oh, what is that? That's uh, three, around 450 maybe $500 to get these three characters out of a roster of 150 tunes, three characters up to the top tier competitive status uh, in a game that's all about, you know, collecting characters and player versus player. They have alliance combats. They have all of these different things where it's a significant benefit if you're into collecting these characters to have them ranked up and ready to go. That is not an acceptable solution. So what GameStar is doing, I am crazily, excitedly uh, happy to support. And I hope more game publications jump on board. If your game is built on grind as pain point to encourage additional spending, then you need to face some kind of consequence in the market. And that also needs to be properly communicated, not only to players, but then also for uh, parents on the periphery of gaming. You know, I would want to know as a parent, when my daughter is old enough to really start playing games, I would want to know, without having to grind and play every single game myself, what kinds of microtransactions are involved with that type of license or that type of, uh, of property? If it's like, you know, she wants to buy a bacon-wrapped gun or she wants to have, like, you know, a Minnie Mouse jetpack, but it doesn't change anything else in the game, well, that's her allowance money. She can go off and spend it. But if those in-game purchases are all about sort of abbreviating gameplay, pay-to-win, or involved in any type 
of unlicensed gambling, then I would absolutely want to know as a parent to put the kibosh on her investing any time, any effort or any energy in a game like that. That That's a terrible state of affairs for the gaming market right now. And it's something that I think we all need to be vocal in opposing. We need to be vocal in opposing it. The game industry needs to be vocal in opposing it. And game reviewers need to be vocal in opposing it because otherwise government gets involved. And that's absolutely not what we want. We want an industry that polices itself because laws surrounding content are almost always terrible and will almost always wreck the application and the further development of that industry. So this is, this is where we're in dangerous territory. I, if the game industry will not police itself, then government needs to get involved. And there's a Chris Lee out of Hawaii has been super progressive about net neutrality, video gaming loot boxes, and he's been very public in drafting uh, legislation, showing you the process of how a bill becomes a law, you know, kind of a very schoolhouse rock kind of a way. From Fat Produce, did you see the Hawaii senator interview and splatter the ESRB lobbyist the other day? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think one of the first uh, first interviews they did with the ESRB was, I want to say it was about almost uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago now. And he posted this interview where he's asking ESRB members very pointed questions about the state of gambling in video games. And one of the most important aspects, and this, this is, again, I am a... I'm hypothetically okay with gambling in video games if there's proper disclosure and that gambling is targeted towards adults, towards adult properties. Gambling in a Disney franchise? Remember, Disney won't even give us a rated R Marvel film, right? So why are they okay with adult mechanics in Star Wars and in Marvel games? They own the license. The buck stops with Disney. We can blame EA for the actual implementation. We can blame Netmarble for Marvel Future Fight's crap implementation. But Netmarble and EA report to Disney as the keepers of those franchises. And I don't believe Disney's super cool and groovy and laid back. Like, oh, yeah, here's a, here's a Marvel. You know, go do whatever you want with the Avengers. We'll be back for a paycheck. Bye. You know, like, that's not Disney. Disney is ruthless. So... So what I would so one of the reasons why that it definitely go I, you know I'll put a link uh, if I can remember to I'll put a link to that video from Chris Lee out of Hawaii. Um, one of the most important questions he asks them is, would a parent know that there was some kind of game altering microtransaction or loot box style gambling based on the rating of the game? That's a really big deal. We, we take it for granted that the solution for government not censoring film was for the film industry to come up with its own ratings so that consumers knew what they were going to get. If you wanted to avoid certain types of adult situations in a film, either for yourself or for your children, then there was a rating affixed to that film that would give you some general benchmark for or general threshold for the content of that film, and you could make an informed decision. Right now, the content of the game, for example, the action of a game, the script, the dialogue, and the content of the game are really all that matter to the ESRB for the game rating. The state of transactions in the game do not influence or affect the rating for that game. We acknowledge that gambling is an adult activity. You go to Vegas... You're, I don't know, can you gamble in Vegas at 18 or do you have to be 21 because of the way that they serve alcohol? You might need to be 21 in most casinos, regardless. That is an adult activity. And as soon as you reach that age threshold, our society says, hey, go nuts. So if you're going to have a gotcha mechanic, a gambling slot machine, random number generating mechanic in your game, then that game needs to be adults only. That needs to have an AO rating, at least a mature rating. And adults and grown-ups and parents and people who have to buy games for their kids need to understand what that means. There is no disclosure for that. There was, you know, if, if a parent walked in blind, saw Star Wars, the video game, picked up Battlefront 2 and tossed it to their kid and said, hey, go play this. It's Star Wars. We like Star Wars. Star Wars is fun. They would not have known the full ramification and scope of that loot box situation. So that is a major issue facing our community. 
So if we're wanting to avoid government intrusion or some sort of uh, people have been mentioning in the live chat like it's uh, I don't know, we've got people talking about guns now or how old do you need to be to buy a gun or if this is communism or something. If you want to avoid government intrusion in this space, then you need to get after game publishers, developers and journalists to really start driving this point home very aggressively because we know the government's going to want to get in, in, involved in something that involves content, distribution, messaging, and art. They always do. This is how we prevent it, is by policing this industry ourselves. Um, let, me, let me scroll back, because there's something going on here with LGH and some other people talking about what's going on. Um, from Kyle Netherwood, you shouldn't have to pay real money for the bacon-wrapped gun. This is actually the thing I'm okay with. You know, if, if let's say I really enjoy a game like Fortnite and I want to support the developers and I also want to do something kind of ridiculous for my character, like I want you know, like all pink Darth Vader armor and that costs $1.99, I'm happy to fork over that cash as an adult with some disposable income to support the developers. What I don't want is my all pink Darth Vader armor to cost $120 and then also make me invincible in the game because then that's not a fun game. Um... From Fat Produce, it's the bacon tax. Uh, from Ganzi Tech Nerd, I remember freemium games on Android exclusively favoring paid players. They still do. Uh, the game company just shifted to another country to avoid being in a class action lawsuit. So this is also, I mean, one of the reasons why we call it gotcha mechanics is there is a trend in Asian game development where everything is increasingly being built on ram random number generators. And why I was so upset about uh, Marvel Future Fight is that it was very straightforward when that game launched. You had an in-game gold, and then you had a premium crystal currency, and everything had a price tag. You would say, I, you know, I want, I want, uh, you know, Captain America to have a better uniform that increases his stats. That's X number of crystals. Done. What they've now instead moved towards for the end game is <clears throat> you will grind for days to accrue a numerous amount of other materials, like They've got these other crystal shards and these phoenix feathers and these urus and these ISO chips. And you build up all of this material and then you just throw it into a random number generator until you get what you want back out of it. But every time you throw that material into a random number generator, it just evaporates. So all of the time that you spent building up all of that stuff just gets thrown away in a slot machine and you can get nothing out of it. So like the Uru generator, which is to help, again, improve all your stats and stuff. You've got two Uru chips, and you try and merge them to make a more powerful Uru chip. But if they don't merge, if that process fails, the material you just threw into that generator just disappears. So it's just gone. And that's how they pad out what they call endgame. And that's not endgame. That's not game. <laughs> That's gambling. Um, I, I, I very much hope that we'll see research on the effects of random number generated events as to whether or not that's in any way different than a slot machine with a real payout. I think psychologically, my hypothesis, psychologically, it's, it's not different to the brain at all. And especially even more insidious when we build that mechanic into a game which targets families, not just adults. Marvel Future Fight is not a grown-up game. It's a family game. Kids can play it just as well as parents can. And so then we're training kids to just get that dopamine hit, that, that excited uh, result when they finally get what they want. That's an addictive, potentially addictive kind of uh, affair to be leveraging at a developing brain. And that's not the gaming experience I want to share with my kids. I want to share the gaming experience where you get that dopamine hit because you accomplished something, because you did something really cool. Like when my daughter gets a little bit older, we're not going to spend time messing around with any game that has some sort of random number generator event. I really want her in like team sport games, like a, like a League of Legends kind of a kind of a setup, or you know just straight up you know deathmatch style <laughs> like Titanfall. Like to see if we can make her really good at Twitch stuff. Um, so from LGH, isn't that communism, as you Americans would call it, relabeling everything you don't like? I have no idea what you're talking about there, dude. Um, from Kyle Netherwood, communism is being very far left. I, I, don't, I don't know where you're at. 
So uh, many mobile games are like this. Technically, you can grind, but unless you pay an unrealistic amount of time, you can't actually get stuff in games. And as, and actually now the, the newer trend is just there there is no way to get a lot of this content until you just pay a ton of real money. Um, um, from Fat Produce, the lobbyist said that loot boxes and pay to win are not a factor in the ESRB rating. And that is a terrible place for the game industry to be. If the game industry does not want government oversight over its content, then they need to not engage in this type of business practice. Um, from Gansey, Te oh, from LGH replying to Gansey Technerd, can't this be regulated by a country by prohibiting certain games to be sold in that country? You can't get all apps everywhere. Again, this is... The, the, the reason why I'm nervous about this is regulation is laws tend to be broadswords where the gaming industry needs a scalpel. We need very fine mechanics to, uh, to, to illustrate or to make this conversation easier for people to engage with. Um, we're never going to solve the problem. So, for example, you know, my solution would be a lot, a lot less regulated and a lot more hands-off from government forces, but strictly implemented from the game industry itself. So let's say there's a gambling mechanic in a game. That game needs to have a mature rating or an AO rating with a disclosure as to why it has a mature or an adults-only rating. Even with those ratings, we still know parents will buy those games for their kids. You know, look, log on, play some Call of Duty or, or you know, how, how many times do you face voices from people whose gonads have not fully matured yet? You know, those gonads haven't dropped. Um, we're, we're always going to face that issue, but I feel that that's the most reasonable uh, solution in that there will be adults who want to engage in that style of gameplay, I guess. I think they're dumb, um, but... I don't want to take that off the table if that's how someone wants to interact with a game. If someone wants to be a whale and dump thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into some pay-to-win kind of game, awesome. Go for it. That is absolutely not what I want to spend my money on, and I don't want to be forced to play games in that kind of paradigm just because that's the only thing developers think that, that, that they can make money on. And we also need to get out of EA's business model where so much of their back-end revenue is built on microtransactions that affect gameplay. That's not a good place for the game industry to be, and it's very not sustainable. So EA is a major corporation with shareholders that expect results. Eventually, that bubble's going to burst too. Again, we're going to talk about a speculative market. Video gaming built on that kind of business behavior will eventually implode. And what does that leave? It's going to leave a giant smoking crater in the games industry, and it's going to set gaming back a while, especially from an investment standpoint. When gaming is not looked upon as being such a profitable investment, we're going to see less innovation in the game space. We're going to see tremendous opportunities for indie gamers to step up, but we're not going to see those giant tentpole spectacle uh, AAA titles that we've come to enjoy being invested in as regularly if they're not making a ton of money on the back end. I think the gaming industry needs to look at, we can make a billion dollars off of $60 per title unit sales. Anything on top of that needs to be looked at as gravy, not the primary wealth generation for that company. Excuse me. Um, from FE1538C, I always look at Angry Joe reviews, game uh, YouTubers warn against loot. I, you know, we're all adding our voices to this, into this discussion. It's just, you know, uh, major tech publications, business news outlets, things like that tend to only dance on this because gaming is still looked at as like gaming's for kids. So much so that they, I don't think they fully appreciate or appropriately disclose what's actually going on right now um from surreal modern games content are now mostly cash locked rather than time locked and and you know they'll make the argument that they're time locked and that you can get around the time lock by spending money um i i want better narrative I, i'm becoming increasingly more of a uh, campaign gamer rather than an online gamer so that's uh you know something i would much rather prefer um we move towards from Bloom, Bloom Malicious, Bloom Malicious, 
Uh, laws are very slow to adapt and not and not very rigid. With something like in-game microtransaction, self-regulation is the best way forward. As soon as you institute something into a law, it is one, it's a pain point that the lawmakers can constantly add legislation to or detract uh, legislation from, that they have way more control over how that goes uh, than the game industry being able to innovate and to iterate on top of, uh, on top of what they need to accomplish. <laughs> uh, from Cheryl, we need a scalpel and a fine pickaxe to chip at the problem. Instead, we have a 100-ton mallet and a wide brush to paint everyone the same. Completely agree. Um, from LGH, certain industries hold these ethical conferences where they agree on something. For example, the hip-hop industry did it about violence, Chinese restaurants in Europe about shark fin soup, and that's what the ESRB should be leading the discussion for game developers and game publishers in the same way. But instead, they're lobbying against government from enacting this kind of legislation. I agree we should be lobbying against government getting involved in content, in censoring content, but they're not having the second part of the, of the discussion where they go back to the developers and the publishers and, publishers and say, this is becoming a problem. You guys need to cut it out. Um, that's we're only having half of the conversation from the lobbyist standpoint. And I'm just catching up with the live chat. There was a lot going on there, too. So, folks, um, that was a lot of news to cover. And I talked for longer than I probably should have. But uh, once this is uh, this is all published and this is all good to go, I'll have links below uh, this post where you can catch up on all the stories here, all the things we talked about, uh, Samsung building phones and destroying NAND memory chips, you know, affecting the global market for storage prices probably over the next couple of days. Um, I, I will try and follow up soon on that Uber car situation out of Arizona. I hope we get better information on that. And just a terrible situation for, for everybody involved, the person behind the wheel of the Uber car to the family of the woman who was unfortunately uh, killed as a result of a collision with, uh, with a self-driving car. And hopefully we can have some grown-up discussion about the ethics surrounding you know uh, machine learning artificial intelligence and self-driving vehicles because we need to kind of get out of the sensational uh, part of the discussion and get to the practical this is going to be a practical consideration in our daily lives and we need grown-ups <laughs> well-adjusted grown-ups to lead those discussions especially those of us here uh, who are participating with uh, with the conversation in regards to technology um, definitely check out, there's still a couple hours left to, uh, grab yourself an honor view 10 that, uh, competition is, uh, going, is going to wrap up very, very soon. I, I think there are less than 10,000 entries. So your odds of winning are actually surprisingly pretty good given the number of entries that you can accrue. I want to, again, uh, shout out to TK Bay and then also, uh, to honor UK for help hooking us up with a great phone to give away. I will be rejoining uh, audio reviews and camera reviews starting with the Honor View 10, and uh, you can catch that on my Patreon page, where I'm also going to be delivering a special public Patreon post for my interview next week with Dr. Uh, Dr. Grimes at UCLA, uh, so we can talk about hearing loss in young people and uh, best practices for listening to your music and protecting your ear health in a world where we can listen to audio 24-7, 365 without interruption if we choose to. I want to thank everybody for joining the Monday Morning Tech Chat. This is always a fun way to have conversations with you. One last post from Sheryl. Are you looking forward to Avengers and Ready Player One? I am tentatively, apprehensively very excited for both. And Ready Player One is going to be a big deal because that is our book of the month for March for the uh, for the Geek Book Club, uh, definitely give that a subscription too. If you want a, a geeky conversation podcast to supplement your uh, your podcast catalog, we read a book a month. It's an online book club that you can also join the conversation on, and it's co-hosted with uh, my buddy Andrew Wallace, who posts uh, publicly as at Fat Produce. He's in the live chat right now. Andrew's a good dude, and uh, we have a lot of fun geeking out over our favorite sci-fi fantasy. Um, and fiction novels, uh, it's a it's really good time. So I hope you'll check out the Geek Book Club. In addition to the SGGQA podcast, which is which is now available through all of your favorite podcast catchers, iTunes, Google Play, 
uh, all that fun stuff. You can uh, you can subscribe or just the RSS feed. You can subscribe, catch all this because we're gonna have a ton of interviews coming up with other content producers, other tech reviewers, some some interesting personalities, and some physicians, some doctors, and politicians regarding technology in our daily lives, uh, lifestyle tech. So I hope you'll check all that out too. Want to thank again? Thank you so much for watching. You know where you can find me around the internet. Uh, this show broadcasts every Monday on Twitch. YouTube and Periscope, um, looking at where else we can maybe broadcast live using a, a really simple solution. And uh, you can follow me around the internet as at some gadget guy. And I will catch you all next week on the next Monday morning tech show chat. Take care.